Today, you're going to be learning about the first book of Maccabees, and we'll be going through chapters 3, chapter 3 to chapter 9. And this will cover the period of Judas Maccabees' military might. Uh, we're going to see a lot of action going on here uh, in this in the six chapters between chapter 3 and chapter 9. Uh, we, last week we talked about the introduction and chapter one and two was part of the introduction. So I am going to show you what is going on in this chapters between chapter three and chapter nine. And this is what is going on. It's a lot, it's a lot. Um, I'll just highlight what I've put in bold because it's talking about Judas Maccabeus. So Judas defeats Apollonius and these are kings or these are leaders of certain domains or territories. He also defeats Seron at Beth Horon. He gathers and encourages Isolele. Um, he defeats the Syrians at Emmaus. Emmaus is also mentioned in the scriptures um, where Isaiah was walking after being resurrected. He was walking with two gentlemen and they didn't realize who he was. Um, there's some good clues in this text about where Emmaus is located. I think it talks about a plain. But also Judas defeats Lysias at Bethzur. Judas defeats the Edomians, Beonites, and Ammonites. And he <clears throat> also has victory together or alongside Simon in Gilead. He also defeats uh, Edomia and Philistia. Whenever I see the word Philistia or Philistines, I think of David telling Goliath, you uncircumcised Philistine. And I know where those communities that are uncircumcised are even today. So I know that's a zip code that we're given whenever you see that term Philistine. Then Judas besieges the tower in Jerusalem. You know, these are the watchtowers. Uh, Judas opposes Alcimus. Judas defeats Nicanor at Kafar Salama. Mm -hmm. Salama, oh my. Okay, Judas defeats Nicanor at Adassar. And in this latter chapters, Judas also gets killed uh, after making a treatise with the Romans. The Romans. Okay, now we're going to do what we did last week, <clears throat> where I'm going to highlight... Some scriptures that stuck out to me, uh, by no means am I doing an exhaustive job of going through all the scriptures between those chapters. I'm just going to highlight some scriptures and pause some questions for us to think about or discuss about. So let's start with this and some scriptures I highlighted in chapter 3, verse 1. And his son Judas, who was called Maccabeus, rose up in his stead. This is after Matthias died, his dad. Judas, his son, rose up in his stead. <clears throat> I think it's significant that it says he rose up. He stepped up to the plate. He didn't just sit and wait for something to happen. He recognized his calling to lead, and he rose up instead of his father to lead his siblings and to lead Isolele. We should also keep stepping up uh, to the plate, especially in this journey that we are on, where few of us are aware of the change that is coming and that we have to implement it. And all his kindred helped him. That's important. Let's help one another. And so did all those who clave to his father, and they fought with gladness the battle of Isolele. We are Isolele. Let's not think of ourselves as this camp or that camp. This one's who believe that the land is here, and this one's who believe the land is somewhere else. No, we are one. We are Isolele. We are one nation. Okay, let's look at some other verses here. <clears throat> They come to us in fullness of insolence and lawlessness to de destroy us and our wives and our children to plunder for to plunder us. But we fight for our lives 
and our laws. I have said it before, for me, this whole experience, as some people call it, the awakening, it's a matter of life and death because we continue to perish as a people. Hosea chapter 4, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. It's a knowledge about the laws. They have ignored the laws. So we are fighting for our lives and we are fighting for those laws that give us this identity as a solely. Moving on here, I'm going to look at some other verses towards the end of this chapter. And they gathered themselves together and came to Mizpah. I looked up that word Mizpah. It means watchtower. I think this is the word that the Jehovah Witness uh, branded themselves with or based on. Watchtower, Mizpah. And they gathered themselves together and came to Mizpah near Jerusalem. For in Mizpah there was a place of prayer aforetime for Israel. So from long time ago, they had established Mizpah as a place where they would go to pray. And Mispa means watchtower. So they're going to keep watch. I hope we can find some inspiration to regularly be at the watchtower, to regularly be praying. And they fasted that day and put on sackcloth and put ashes upon their heads and tore their clothes and laid open the book of the law concerning which the Gentiles were wont to inquire, seeking the likeness of their idols. They were serious about it. I mean, this was maybe 100 to 200 years before the common era or the time of Christ. And when they fasted, they put on sackcloth. You know, until 2020, I had not seen people who were still putting on sackcloth when they were fasting. But I got to see that with the Bantu Tokoista group. They had a teaching on that and they were indicating how they do the fasting. You know, they were making it serious business, you know. Um, maybe we can get inspired to get to that level, at, at least when it comes to our spirituality. All right, let me jump to verse chapter four. Um, so in chapter four, found this verse is here. And Judah said to the men that were with him, Fear you not their multitude, neither yeah, fear you not their multitude, neither be you afraid of their onset. Remember how our fathers were saved in the sea of reeds when Pharaoh pursued them with an army. And now let's cry to heaven if he will have us and will remember the covenant of our fathers and destroy this army before our face today and all the gentiles shall know that there is one who redeems and saves isolely i found it very interesting first of all if some of you haven't noticed it says here sea of reeds it doesn't say the red sea which is the correct thing when pharaoh was uh, pursuing them but the key thing here is that you know, we shouldn't be worried about the numbers if they seem, if their opponent seems to have larger numbers, because the most high, larger numbers don't matter to him. The power of heaven is what will deliver us. And they cried out to heaven. So we have to cry out to heaven to help us. And the most high will remember the covenant he has with our forefathers and destroy our opponents, no matter how big of a multitude they are, no matter how sophisticated their weaponry. As long as we continue to rely on the Most High, you know, He will come through for us. But the reason we're praying that He comes through for us is not just to overcome them, but it is so that the Gentiles shall know that there is one who redeems us and saves Isolele. When we make our prayers, let's peg it on giving the Most High the credit. That was my point there. All right, let's go to chapter, I mean, verse 47 to 51 of chapter 4. And they took whole stones according to the law and built a new altar after the fashion of the former, the former altar. 
and they built the holy place. So here they're rebuilding the altar, they're cleaning the temple after it had been desecrated by the Gentiles. And they are following the law. They took whole stones, not chipped stones, not fashioned stones, according to the law. They felt it was important to follow the instructions. They built a new altar after the fashion of the order of the former, and they built the holy place and the inner parts of the house, and they hallowed the courts, and they made the holy vessels new. They brought the candlestick and the altar of burnt offerings and of incense and the table into the temple. What do you see today in the churches that tries to mirror this? And they burned incense upon the altar. And they lighted the lamps that were upon the candlestick. And they gave light in the temple. And they set loaves upon the table. And spread out the veils. And finished all the works which they made. Think about what they're doing today in the churches. What do they call this whole process? Weren't they, aren't they trying to imitate what was happening here in the times of old? I think they are. Uh, in Christianity especially. That's what they're trying to imitate. All right, let's look at one more verse here. And at that season, they built up the Mount Sion with high walls and strong towers round about, lest haply the Gentiles should come and tread them down as they had done before or aforetime. So they're fortifying, they're building high walls to protect the city of Jerusalem, because it was um, that's it was on Mount Zion. What are we doing to fortify or to build strong walls around us? How are we informing, getting ourselves better informed? How are we getting our families, our communities better informed on the truth? That's how we build these stronger walls. All right, chapter 5. And Judas fought against the children of Esau. Esau. In Idumea at Akrabatin, because they besieged Israel. And he struck them with great slaughter and brought down their pride and took their spoils. I mean, Esau has been a tit since the times of Jacob and his brother. His descendants are still a tit fighting Jacob, you know, up to 200, 100 years before the common era. They're still doing it today. We call them the Edomites, you know. You can't fight somebody you don't know. You gotta know who your enemy is and understand that some of these fights have started a long time ago. <laughs> and let's be careful not to be deceived by some of these people. All right, let me jump. That was verse 3. Let me go on to verse 61, 62, and 65 in chapter 5. Okay, <clears throat> I'll read from verse 60 here for some context. And Joseph and Azariah were put to flight and were pursued to the borders of Judea. And there fell on that day of the people of Isolele about 2,000 men. Okay, Isolele was getting a beating. And there was a great overthrow among the people because they didn't listen to Judas and his relatives, kindred, thinking to do some exploit. Some people were trying to be heroes or sheroes, but they were not. This is why they were beaten. They were not of the seed of those men by whose hand deliverance was given to Isolele. I'll comment when I read the last one here. And Judas and his kindred went forth and fought against the children of Esau in the land towards the south. And he struck Hebron. So Judas and his team went and struck Hebron. Remember where we saw Hebron was located uh, when we were talking about Mamre? Uh, and the villages thereof and pulled down the strongholds thereof and burned the towers thereof round about. Two things, stick to your lanes, brothers and sisters. If you have a calling, if you have a gifting, 
stick to that calling, stick to that lane, because sometimes we try to step out of our lanes and we end up getting beat. Like this gentleman or people here who were trying to be heroes and sheroes, but they were not of the seed of those men whose hand deliverance was given to. All right, somebody needs to mute. Um, all right, I have muted them. All right, um, going on, let's go to, so the second thing there was, um, so first thing, stick to your lanes. Second thing, um, this location where the children of Hebron, I mean, the children of Esau were defeated, it was the land towards the south, and we know Hebron is in that area around Botswana. So this ties in with what we've been seeing before when we're studying Mamre. You know, this Hebron is towards the south and that's where it is, you know. And the children of Esau are the ones who met, actually Esau met Joseph when Joseph was going to bury Jacob and Esau put up a fight and that's the day that Esau was killed. And that was in that promised land area. You know, so we see now the children of Esau are still fighting. So we do have children of Esau amongst us. That's the second point. We, we have to be aware of them. We have to be aware of uh, our opponents, even if they look like us and behave like us. Okay, let's go to chapter six. Um, we'll jump to verse 34. And they showed the elephants the blood of grapes and mulberries that they might prepare them for the battle. Obviously, where are they getting elephants? So where are they? Which land or which continent are they in? It's a continent that has elephants. Uh, second thing here that I didn't want to take for granted. If any of you has ever been to what they call a national park or a safari, where you go to a national park and you see animals, your guides would normally tell you some interesting things about animals. And you've got to be either living around these animals or have read a lot about them to understand things like this. That elephants, you know, when they're shown the blood of grapes or the juice of grapes and mulberries, you know, they get aggravated. When you go to the national parks, the guides will tell you all these interesting things that animals do, how they cooperate, how they have developed skills of, you know, uh, working together. For example, the birds in the air might start making some certain noises to alert the antelopes that there's a lion in the distance that's crouching and trying to come and attack them. You've got to have that knowledge from the land, you know. So how is it that these people had this knowledge? It's because they lived where these animals were. All right. Let me jump on to 43 and 46. Now, this one, um, let's see here. Um, yeah, 43 to 46. Um, okay, I should have highlighted it, but I didn't. But to me, this was like maybe a scene out of Wakanda or something. <laughs> You know, and Eliezer, who was called Avaran, saw one of the beasts armed with royal breastplates. So they're at war and they have this beast like the elephants. And the kings, and, and this beast was higher than all the beasts. He was huge, he was tall. And the king seemed to be upon him. So Eliezer thinks that the king is on this huge elephant or huge beast, might be a rhino or something. And so Eliezer gives himself up. He sacri he you know, volunteers to try and kill the king, deliver his people, and get to him an everlasting name. He wants to be famous. You know, he wants to have a legacy that he killed the king. And so Eliezer ran upon this person on this big beast, courageously into the midst of the phalanx. I think this is like a giraffe, and killed on the right hand and on the left. He killed anyone he would meet. And they parted asunder from him on this side and on that side. And he crept under an elephant that that person was sitting on and 
thrust a sword probably from beneath and killed the elephant. And the elephant fell to the earth upon him and killed Eliezer. What do we learn from this? Let's not try to be heroes and sheroes just to get fame and then we get harmed. Let's be smart about it, you know. This guy made an assumption that the king was on that beast. So he thought, you know, he can score more brownie points by going and trying to kill the person on the big beast. And yes, he killed the elephant, but he also lost his life, you know. Why not just follow the commands of your captain or your commander and fight like you're supposed to be? Uh, so let's follow protocol in the organizations that we go into. Um, and, you know, we should achieve the goals that we have. I thought that was quite quite a scene uh, out of Wakanda there or the movie 300. All right, let's go to chapter 37. I mean, chapter 7 and go to verse 31. Sorry, so, and Nicanor knew that his counsel was discovered, and he went out to meet Judas in battle beside Kafar Salama. Why does this place have the word Salama, which is like a Swahili word that they have also converted later on and called Shalom in their Hebrew? Um, what is this place? Could it be something like Dar es Salaam in Tanzania? I don't know. I thought that was interesting that we have a word or place called Kafar Salama. And after these things, Nicanor went up to Mount Zion and there came some of the priests out of the sanctuary and some of the elders of the people to salute him peaceably and to show him the whole burnt sacrifice that was being offered for the king. And he mocked them and laughed at them and in, so this is Nicanor who's mocking them and entreated them shame, shamefully and spoke haughtily. He's doing all this to Judas and the other Israelites and swear in a rage saying, unless Judas and his army will be now delivered into my hands, it shall be that if I come again in peace, I will burn up this house. And he went up out in a great rage. So this guy is really being very arrogant. He's laughing at them. He's mocking them. He thinks he's all that. Now, I'm, I'm going to look at these verses here and not even plan to look at them. But And the priests, the priests of Isolili, entered in and stood before the altar and the temple, and they wept and said, You did choose this house to be called by your name. Now they're praying to be a house of prayer and supplication for your people. Nicanor is saying all this nasty stuff in the temple. So the priests now decide to pray. Look at their prayers. You did choose this house to be called by your name, to be a house of prayer and supplication to your people. So they pray and they say, take vengeance on this man and his army and let them fall by the sword. Remember their blasphemies. So remember what they're saying with their mouths and suffer them not to live any longer. You know, they're praying about what the Nicanor guy is doing. So, and on the 13th day of the month, Adar, the armies joined battle and Nicanor's army was discomfited or defeated and he himself was the first to fall in the battle. Okay. Look at what happened to him. Isolele took the spoils and the booty and they struck off Nicanor's head and his right hand which he stretched out so haughtily and brought them and hung them up beside Jerusalem. I mean, this guy's from Isolele, or like trying to really make a point, you know, that the, the hand you're stretching out and the blasphemy you're speaking, now we're going to mock you when we've taken you out, you know. And their priests actually were praying for that. Again, it's that mouth and those hands that you're stretching out. I thought it was very interesting that, you know, they were not just sitting there and just doing nothing about it and praying and hoping. No, they were praying, but they were also, their armies were acting accordingly. And Judas heard of the fame of the Romans, that they are valiant men and have pleasure in all that join themselves to them. 
and make friends with all such as come to them. So here we are seeing Isolele is going to strike a deal with the Romans. So if Isolele is in Africa and the Romans are wherever they are, they are able to interact with them and make a deal. This tells us that these two communities were accessible to each other or one another. Okay, let's jump to verse 19. And they went to Rome. This is a solely. And the way was exceedingly long or exceeding long. So the distance was long to Rome. And they entered into the Senate house and answered and said, why did I highlight this? Because they're engaging politically. They were involved in politics. Of course, Judas was leading the army of Isolele, you know, or he was a political leader. So he's engaging politically. There's, there's no separation here of church and state like we say in America, <laughs> you know. The people who are praying are the people who are fighting, some of them, and they're going to engage another country's political uh, structure, the Senate. And this is the copy of the writing which they wrote back again on the tables of brass and sent to Jerusalem. This is what the Romans wrote and sent to Jerusalem, that it might be with them there for a memorial of peace and confederacy. They had a deal, a political deal. We got your back, you got our back, right? With the Romans. If you read on on the story, you will see that they did not honor their deal as the Romans. In the same manner, moreover, if war come first upon the nation of the Look at what they're writing, the nation of the Jews, instead of writing the nation of Israel or Isolele. Now they're calling themselves a nation of the Jews. The Romans shall help them as confederates with all their soul as the occasion shall prescribe to them. So these Gentile Romans are writing and signing documents and saying, we got your back. According to these words, have the Romans made a covenant thus with the people of the Jews? Great. Let's see if they keep their covenant. And Judah said, let it not be so that I should do this thing. Judah is saying he doesn't want to flee from the people that want to attack them. And if our time is come, let's die in a manly way for our kindred's sake, our relative, our community, our country's sake, and not leave a cause of reproach against our glory. Some versions say, let's not leave a stain in our legacy. You know, say, let's not run away. Okay. And the right wing was discomfited by them, and he pursued after them to the Mount Azotus. This mount, where is it? It's mentioned even in the Bible, Azotus. Is it in Africa or is it somewhere else? And Jonathan and Simon took Judas, their brother, and buried him in the cell pocket sepulcher of his fathers at Modin. So Judas has been killed, unfortunately. And he's been killed by the Romans, pretty much. Uh, and where is this Modin? Because it's mentioned a lot of times. Because that is where Judas was buried by his brothers, Jonathan and Simon. And the rest of the acts of Judas and his wars and the valiant deeds which he did and his greatness, they are not written, for there were many. And it came to pass after the death of Judas that the lawless put forth their heads in all the coasts, plural, of Israel or Isolele. So if you look at the modern day so-called state of Israel, does it have coasts as a plural? Or is it just one coastline? along the Mediterranean. And all those who wrought against equity and uh, who wrought iniquity rose up. So a lot, Judas did a lot, uh, though little is written uh, about him in these books. And many of those things um, were not written that he did. Okay, so those are some of the points that I find uh, interesting. Let's get into some discussion. Thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. Please remember to like, subscribe and share if you find this content helpful.